Hello, my name is Greg Massey, and this is episode number 45 of The Color of Air, a podcast about the musical journey. Now, the podcast has been back for a couple weeks now, and the response has been truly incredible. So thank you for supporting us and for tuning in. And ever since the podcast debuted in 2014, I just recently found out it's been downloaded over 30,000 times, which may not seem like a lot given the amount of time. However, given all the starts and stops and the fact that we only have 45 episodes now, I say that's a really, really cool achievement. So I'm very proud and I'm very happy. And again, just want to thank everybody for their support. On today's podcast, I feature an interview with Evergreen, who is someone I have been pretty excited to talk to ever since I started planning the return of the podcast. I first discovered their music through the project Fogweaver, but since then I've also learned Evergreen is the creative force behind Delmaco, Hideous Gomphidious, Snowspire, Evergreen Refuge, Draconic Regicide, and just about a week before I started recording this, they dropped another new project called Keys to an Era. And besides all the projects that Evergreen is part of, they also run Fable Glade Records, which releases seasonal batches of music from Evergreen and other artists to help kind of, you know, support the scene, which I think is really, really cool. Since Evergreen is an artist that has multiple different projects, I really enjoyed being able to talk to them and understand the stories the motivations, the gear, how do you keep all the band camp pages straight, you know, all the different stuff that goes into having multiple projects like this. As well, we talk about a mutual love of Philip K. Dick, the Buffy the Vampire Slayer universe, and really just had a nice, fun chat. I mentioned being new to the Dungeons and scene a couple times during the course of this interview, and as I was preparing the finishing touches on my first Dungeon Synth record, Evergreen was one of the artists that I immediately sent it to because I'm a huge fan of Fogweaver. I'm a huge fan of Hideous Gomphidious. I mean, I was editing and working on the artwork for my record while listening to Fogweaver. It just, it set the mood perfectly. So it was really cool to get a very cool response back from Evergreen that was very supportive and made me feel welcome in this scene. So... It was a no-brainer to have them on the podcast. So let me introduce you to one of the many worlds Evergreen has been responsible for creating. This is from their latest project, Keys to an Era, and the album Worlds Between, and this track is called Casting Dream Spells. Thank you. 
So first off, uh, <laughs> I just want to make sure I get everything straight on your projects because as I've learned in my brief time in the dungeon sensing scene, everybody's got a gazillion different projects. <laughs> so <laughs> let me get my pencil out. Uh, so we've got Fogweaver, Hideous Gomphibius, and if I pronounce anything wrong, let me know. Delnaco, Draconic Regicide, and also you're the owner of Fable Glade Records. Am yeah. I missing anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, within Dungeon Synth, I also have Snow Spire. Uh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Cool. All right, good. Um, and they're all on separate Bandcamp pages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I feel like this is a question I can I can post both you and Adam Matlock if I ever get uh, get him on here. How do you do it? <laughs> How do you manage all the separate Bandcamp pages? Because I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I forgot. I also uh, I also have a project called One Limb. Wand Limb. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then I have a few, I have several other things that are not dungeon synth. Um, how do I manage it? Uh, I don't know. I, I think it's just like masochistic at a certain point. Like I, uh, prior to even actually being in, in uh, dungeon synth, I, my project for a long time was uh, called Evergreen Refuge, um, which is more like metal, ambient, nature, acoustic, kind of all over the place. Um, and But I, I've always kind of balanced and juggled several other projects. And I think... I think the way that it, like my brain works um, with a lot of that stuff is that I like I I have one project that I focus on um, that I don't really consider like my main project. I don't like to think of any of them as like side projects or anything like that. Um, but I do have one in, that I you know I come back to a lot and. Um, but then I get these other ideas that don't really fit into that. So I like I'll go work on something else and come back to the other project kind of feeling a little bit more refreshed and have some new ideas for it. But as for like juggling the band camp pages and stuff, it's kind of weird. I, I keep it all on the same, like my same email. Um, so it's all coming into the same place, but, uh, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's hectic for sure. <laughs> I can't even imagine what Adam, I mean, Adam has like, I swear for a while there. It's, it's yeah. I think it's 20 something. I, I, I'm looking forward to getting him on here so I can pinpoint each one. Cause I'm like, I just want to make sure, I guess I want to make sure I'm a completist too, you know, from picking up everybody's projects and supporting everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a while there where it seemed like weekly I would find out some project that I already liked or like, a new project I found is Adam and it's like, yeah, it was for a while there. It was kind of comical. Well, and well, that was, and that was kind of my experience with your music too, because, you know, as I was trying to find, I don't want to say find my way, but you know, like I'd always been told, Hey, you should check out the dungeon synth scene. It's really cool. It's very welcoming. Um, which I am all for. And I remember the first thing I heard was fog weaver even when I was working on artwork or anything for my other releases, I usually would have fog weaver on the background. I found it, it was a very cool soundtrack to me doing other artistic stuff. So, and then, but then, you know, hideous gomphibious I heard about and I was like, Oh, this is really cool too. And then I forget how I figured it out, but I was like, Oh wait, it's the same person. <laughs> 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 and then, you know, and then, and then learning about, Del Maco was really cool too because you know um because you know I'm obviously not a dungeon synth purist in any stretch of the imagination because I'm still relatively new I'm just I just love music so mm. 
and I love different vibes. And, you know, it, you know, I guess I can focus a little bit on Del Maco because you just had the listening party for it, for the new, the new record, which is amazing. But one thing that always kind of strikes me is, is the idea of storytelling with each of these projects. I guess we could start with Del Maco. So what, you know, what kind of inspired that in terms of, a, did you have like a story idea or did you have kind of like, you know, the more, I, I don't want to say more sci-fi music, but you know, it's, it's definitely got its own identity as opposed to the other projects you do. Well, so the, the first album I did with that, um, really it actually was inspired. <laughs> My, I had, um, some computer issues. So I was struggling with recording, um, music on my computer and, but I, I have this Tascam four track that, um, I've used for various projects over the years. And so I like, I just started thinking about how much I, and this is something I, I really like about dungeon synth in particular and cassette culture, obviously <laughs> Got, I have a bunch of cassettes behind me. Um, but um, is that there, there's this like just beautiful magic that happens when you have very like synthesized electronic music on such an analog medium I, that like the warmth of that and just the way synths are, sound already and then the way they're kind of manipulated by these warm analog textures and some of the impurities with um, with that, it's just something I find really beautiful. So I like, that was kind of what really started it was I, my computer was messed up. I started messing around with recording onto my four track. Um, so the first album kind of came about from that. And I've, uh, I've always been a fan of, especially Philip, Philip K. Dick's, um, oh, yeah. sci-fi novels. So that's where the name comes from. Del Maco is a planet in one of his books. Oh, okay. um, yeah. And so the first one, I really wanted to just kind of capture the way Philip K. Dick's books in particular make me kind of feel. Cause I, I always get this weird, um, kind of surreal feeling from his, his work. So, uh, yeah, that was kind of where that, originally came from. And I honestly never really thought I would return to the project. It, it was two years um, after, which is long for me, I guess, to return to a project. Um, yeah, I kind of considered that a little bit of a one-off. But then last year, I just got to thinking about, um, you know, I was working on other synthesizer music, and I, I started to think about the story of humanity leaving planet earth because climate change has essentially rendered it too hot to live on. And, um, so they go to a planet that has water, uh, but it turns out that it's just uninhabitably icy. And I liked that, um, the juxtaposition there, where it's kind of like they're leaving a place cause it's, they can't live on it cause it's too hot. And then they end up on a planet that's too cold. Um, so that was Cerulean Tomb, <clears throat> my the album I did last year, and just something about rebirthing the that project. Oh, and and when I went to that, I actually I didn't record that on four track. Um, I did it all in a DAW and everything uh, with my synthesizer, and um, just a way of coming up with a story and a whole narrative with the music, kind of rebirthed. Um, Del Maco in a way that that's kind of the direction I see it continuing and the direction I've continued with, with this, the most recent album, the colony um, is that I just, I kind of want to leave that for almost making soundtracks um, to stories that either I come up with or I've had the idea of doing it based on other stories again in the future. Okay, cool. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I loved, um, I mean, each of the albums is really cool, um, but just because it's fresh in my head, I mean, The Colony, I mean, I mean, 
as a listener, I totally get the soundtrack vibe. And I found myself really kind of engrossed by the story because you had the, you know, I, I, <laughs> I missed the story scrolling by when I was <laughs> listening to the live stream because I was making dinner at the same time. But, you know, going back and revisiting it on the Bandcamp page and, um, you know, uh, you know, it gave me this kind of, I, I know other people in the chat were kind of throwing out, you know, oh, is it based on the thing? Is it based on this, that or other things? But I mean, just without knowing any specific influence, it kind of reminded me of kind of like a like a sci-fi Lovecraft kind of vibe to me, you know, yeah. you know, with a little bit of body horror kind of stuff thrown in there. Um, is that accurate or? <laughs> yeah, I. Um, that's interesting because I I do I think it is sort of like the the idea. I left the story a little bit ambiguous. Um, just because, I don't know, I had a very specific vision, but sometimes I think it's nice to leave some ambiguity for people to fill yeah. in the spaces. Um, and But yeah, for me, like the whole concept is very, very much like a cosmic horror because it's like where the inspiration came from in particular is cordyceps mushrooms that um, infect... Um, like insect colonies and they essentially infect an insect and the insect goes and um, infects the other insects by bringing this, this fungus that ends up exploding and growing out of their head. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I just thought that was interesting. And yeah, taking that and putting it on a planet where it's like, now there's this whole planet that's full of life forms like that. I, I thought was kind of interesting. And I know a lot of cosmic horror kind of does that where it takes something very, um, either earthy or very like something we're very familiar with, but turns it into like this larger kind of horror concept. So I, I yeah, I think that there's definitely some influence there. Cool, cool. Um, and just, uh, so I do go off on tangents a lot with these interviews. These are not like strict. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> strict That's interviews. Right. So, I mean, uh, one thing though, I, you know, you mentioned Philip K. Dick. I mean, I, I, I love Philip K. Dick. I wish I read more of him. I mean, there's still like so many of his books and stories I want to read, but, um, I, I really kind of, you know, I get that feeling you're talking about because I know that it, I feel like for me and you can, uh, you know, see if you can relate to this at all. Like my experience with Philip K. Dick for the longest time was just the movies, you know, the of his stuff. So, you know, I really like Blade Runner. You know, I'd seen Total Recall like 30 years ago, so I can't remember if I liked it or not, but uh uh, or Minority Report and all these things. And then what I found was reading his books was every movie kind of misses the mark <laughs> about yeah. about some, con you know, because I, I feel like there's some concepts that he puts forth in his books that are just so, so amazing to me that like kind of tie the story together but those never seem to translate to the movie. So I was just like, now I see why everyone kind of bitches about movies that are made of, <laughs> made on his books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was actually just talking to my partner about that the other night. Um, we we're talking about how it's interesting because so, so many of his works have been adapted to movies um, or if not directly, kind of indirectly, there's plenty of, if you if you notice if you've read a lot of Philip K. Dick, you see the influence in a lot of like um, a lot of like psychological thrillers, science fiction, all kinds of stuff. Um, but the the funny thing about it is, yeah, it's, I don't think it always translates that well. I think that and his books are kind of weird a lot of times where it's more about what's going on with like internally with the characters and what they're yeah. thinking and what they're interpreting. And but so many of his books actually don't actually don't end up uh, resolving in any way. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah. you know, 
movies in general, we like a resolve. We like the nice, uh, I don't know, kind of typical structure. And so it does, it doesn't always work well, but his concepts do like the, the basic core, the basic like pit of it, it definitely translates well into a lot of movies. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I think, you know, the example I always go to when I talk about this with people is I say, yeah, I love Blade Runner. You know, Blade Runner is a movie totally cool and, you know, with the ambience and the effects and the score and, and the performances, it's all very, very cool. But when you read um, Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, I feel like there's this whole kind of almost spiritual side in the book because there's that um because you know there's the whole idea of, of of humans caring for electric animals as opposed to real animals to mm-hmm. provide that kind of you know mental i guess comfort and then and then there's i believe it's it's been a while since i read it but there was the whole spiritual thing of the person pushing the rock up or something like that i forget the details on sound like an idiot now but but i felt like there's this whole spiritual aspect to the novel which i think doesn't really translate as well into the movie um so i was kind of like oh that would have been so cool but yeah like you said it's it's hard to film that (laughs) yeah yeah definitely yeah um now uh now next up so now to go back to uh fog weaver so Fogweaver is pretty much uh, based on the Ursula K. Le Guin books, correct? Yeah, based on Earthsea. Okay, and so um, I, I guess uh, what was I know did the did the music come first or the concept for that? Were you were you just kind of you know what I mean? Like, or did it, did reading the books kind of give you this? kind of musical picture in your head which you then translated yeah i think it was um it was mostly that um yeah i was i was rereading the books and uh there's just a lot uh a lot there's an interesting atmosphere that those books have at least to me that is um it just really is perfect for what I like. It's very dreamy and kind of surreal and uh, magical, but then there's parts that are extremely dark and, um, but yeah, I, I kind of, I started to, when I was rereading them, I, I was sort of imagining some of the music and it was kind of when I was first discovering or rediscovering really Dungeon Synth, um, and falling in love with it. And, of course, there's plenty. You know, there's plenty of Tolkien influence and lots of Dungeon Synth. There's plenty of, um, I don't know. You know, there's like influences from like Conan to, yeah, Tolkien all over the place. All the classic fantasy, and I just so I think it was kind of a mix of already kind of wanting to create a project around Earth Earthsea, um, and then sort of. I, I didn't find until quite a bit later any other Earthsea projects. There's one, well, there's Aerith Akbe, uh, which I did a split with. And then there was one that I don't even remember when the first demo or album they came out with was, but uh, called Ogi on the Silent. And uh, other than that, I never, I couldn't find anything that was directly inspired by Earthsea. So it was one, part me wanting to uh, create that atmosphere that I like uh, from those books and then part um, seeing a lack of Earthsea influence in it. And on top of that, it was it was kind of my first, like my own first foray into creating Dungeon Synth. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a, a mixture of things, but yeah, mostly came from the the love of the books. Cool, cool. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't necessarily feel like I need to get into all the <laughs> all the stories behind every one of your projects, but 
I have to know. <laughs> I have to know uh, what inspired Hideous Gumphibius because because <laughs> that. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I love that project too, and you did a, an amazing performance this year at the the Dungeon Siege. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, what inspired? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Hideous Confidious is kind of, I, I like partly wanted to create something that was a little bit more of an outlet for weirder dungeon synth textures and a little bit more, because I had, I sort of have a tendency when, with all the projects that I do and kind of why I like have so many sometimes is that I put things in a little box. I'm like, okay, this project is, um, Dungeon synth that sounds this way that's based on the Earthsea books, and and like that box starts to even actually get a little bit smaller as I like feel out where you know what I uh, like and don't like about the project or what worked atmospherically for me or or whatever. Um, so I I sort of wanted to make something that would be a little bit more open ended and explore something that was. Uh, darker because I don't I don't it's I consider all of my projects kind of dark but <laughs> it's hard to feel that way sometimes I, I don't know how to explain that I guess but um but yeah I so it was kind of me wanting to make something like that and I obviously with Del Maco's recent album um and then those who have like followed my Evergreen Refuge works I, i've had a couple albums specifically about mushrooms i'm very i'm very fascinated by fungi and and stuff um and just how weird a lot of they a lot of them are and a lot of uh just the the way that they're resilient and stuff is just something that i've i've worked into a lot of things i've done for a while um so i guess i started to think about okay, I want it to be dark and like, there's a lot of mystery around mushrooms and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things we don't know. And then of course there's like, you know, there are mushrooms out there that can poison you if you eat them. And so I, I kind of was thinking about exploring that as kind of the theme and it, it more or less came together in like an abstract way. So it kind of, I started to think more about, um okay what if these like what if there's like kind of a a bunch of sort of wizard troll things that worship these mushrooms and kind of conjure them and so, so it, it's like sort of this whole whole weird weird atmosphere in my head that I don't actually have a full narrative or like story of and I kind of don't want to um cuz I just like the like creating that atmosphere and it's been interesting to see people getting their own things out of that like the most <clears throat> my last album uh keepers of the fungal order i imagined very much as like falling into or like stumbling upon this this cave that is full of a bunch of creepy trolls and critters and fungus everywhere and uh, almost like coming up, coming into like a a cult or something. <laughs> so I, that's sort of what I imagine. But I've had friends who said, like one of my friends actually said that that album was like, like felt very spiritual to them. And I thought that was interesting because that's, that wasn't my intention. But I think that's the beauty of um, leaving some of the things abstract. So I like to play with that a little bit, have some projects where it's like, this is the specific atmosphere. It's based on Earth C. It's this way. Um, but then other things I do like to try to leave a little bit o more open ended. So I think that's where it came from is just having an outlet for some of the weirder and a little bit more abstract textures and atmospheres. Yeah, I, I'd even uh, go as far to say <clears throat> um, I feel like the textures that come through in Hideous amphibious are definitely more visceral synth sounds i don't know if that if, if that's the best way to describe it but i just you know like they're 
they hit you <laughs> in a good way <laughs> in a good yeah. way and and I, and i love that and and i love the variety between all the different projects that you do because of that i mean it's just yeah, each one has their own <clears throat> their own kind of vibe which you know i love i mean i was listening to a bunch of them kind of leading up to this and just trying to get in that in that mode now i just wanted to ask a little bit about um fable glade so with so you know, you're, you're doing the, you know, most, most, I guess, I shouldn't say most, because I don't have an accurate <laughs> count here, but, you know, a lot of Dungeons and projects are done, you know, it's people releasing things on their own. Um, obviously, with the kind of cassette culture, cassettes are a little bit cheaper to make, obviously, than other things. So, and, you know, and then some people, you know, so what kind of inspired you then say, okay, well, I want to take my own make create my own kind of label to promote other artists like what was the first step in that mm. well i've done i've kind of dabbled with it a little bit before um i a, my friend cooper and i run run like a much smaller than fable glade record label uh, for our own material called a moment of clarity recordings. Um, and that's kind of like, so I had some experience with putting things out specifically on, on cassette. And, um, I knew that I sort of, I, I've had enough experience doing that and doing a lot of those things on my own that I sort of know my way around it a little bit. So I, I've always thought about doing a larger label of sorts and um, and yeah so once I, I felt like I had these the the skills to actually go forward with it I um, decided the dungeon synth or fantasy synth or kind of a mishmash of a lot of the ambient music that I like was a good place to start that and um, Fable Glade kind of actually like aesthetically and everything was almost just another project of mine. <laughs> I like almost, um, I don't know. I had, I sort of had this like idea of doing uh, something that was very focused on the season. So Fable Glade comes out, each batch comes out with each equinox and solstice and so I've, I've always thought about doing stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, gathering friends who I, I really love their music and like already collect some of their music. I, I was like, well, you know, I, I may as well put some of these skills to use and, and help put some of my friends' music out. Cause not everybody knows their way around doing that. And, um, or whatever. And, and the other aspect of that is getting, having, once you start getting a fan base with a label, especially in Dungeon Synth, I've noticed, uh, people kind of become loyal to labels in a way. And I know for myself, I, I'm a big collector. I have a bunch of uh, tapes behind me from Gondolin Records, and I collect like all, everything that they do. And, um, uh, something I really like about that is I've discovered a lot of my favorite artists through actually just following a label and um, really liking how they curate things and kind of putting a little trust in them. And then I go and I try to, as much as I can, I try to support the artists that I find through that. Um, and so that was kind of an inspiration too is, okay, I have these friends who I love their music. They make great music but maybe they haven't um, gotten their name out there as much. So I figured once I could kind of get to where Fable Glade had a little bit more of a uh, fan base or, or people who liked what I put out, that I could, you know, put some of my friends out there and, and um, bring, draw some attention to my, either my friends or projects that I really like. Um, so yeah, the, I guess, I guess that's it. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Well, I mean, I, I think that's, that's really cool. 
and it kind of speaks to again just you know based on my very limited experience but i just you know i just found um even though not everything kind of falls under that dungeon synth um genre i just feel like there is a lot of support among a lot of the artists where yeah where i mean i've i found it very welcoming for the stuff i did and that kind of in turn made me feel very good but then you know and then also it makes me want to support the other people and and you know it's you know it's not obviously it's not not a competition or anything like that and and i kind of liked that i liked that kind of you know just the you know we're all kind of trying to do different things and you know and i realize obviously there are you know kind of but there are like in every scene the dungeon thief gatekeepers <laughs> you know who yeah. would think it should be this this and you know fine but you know i i to, to me i feel like um the you know the the idea is to okay well we're all kind of creating music you know and, and just noticing you know some of it's hi-fi some of it's lo-fi some people pay for really intricate artwork some people draw something you know what i mean but like but we all kind of there there is like this kind of support system for where it's just like yeah you know you don't need you know if you want to have like really expensive artwork and can afford it cool if you want to create you know you know a, a run of 10 tapes with each cover hand done by you you know that's cool too and and i like you know i like that kind of vibe it's 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 definitely more supportive um then like i said then i've kind of experienced in various different uh different things out there so i don't know if it, did you if, if you felt the same thing and that kind of encouraged you to put your stuff out there <laughs> yeah yeah i you know it's interesting like i've seen people gripe about how <clears throat> dungeon since uh got a pretty easy entry point for a lot of people um, to make their own own music. And just for the exact reasons you said, I mean, you could go get, like I did, pull out an old Yamaha keyboard and just get going and start a project. Or for a lot of people, it's like working in FL Studio or something like that. Um, and you're doing, you know, most, most of these people are doing it all themselves. So it's uh, pretty easy to just kind of make your own music and, start a project and pe I've seen people gripe about that, but I think that's one of the coolest things about dungeon synth is that, um, there are people of like a variety of points. I'm not going to say skill level cause I don't really care that much about that. <laughs> um, but just at, at different points or, or different styles or, or whatever it may be, um, that, are making stuff that's under this like pretty broad umbrella. And what's cool about that is, yeah, I've, my experience with Dungeon Synth is that a lot of people are both creators and like huge fans of the genre. So it's sort of this funny like microcosm or like micro uh, economy or something where like people are getting support from others and sharing that support with others and it, and passing it back and forth. And I think that's actually one of the coolest parts of it. And it's also just awesome to me that like, I don't really know why people take issue with more people creating. I think that's a cool thing. And, you know, we can kind of all, you know, work to discuss kind of the nuances and in, in different projects that people have um because yeah there's there's a lot out there but at the same time like when you start digging into it there's so much variety when you have like lo-fi hi-fi uh vampiric you know whatever it may be there's all kinds of stuff that it's all fitting in the same place and can all kind of co-exist but there's differences too and i think that's kind of a cool thing specifically in this genre i just want to jump in to say thank you for listening 
And here are the ways that you can support us. Subscribe to The Color of Air on your favorite podcast app like Apple, Stitcher, Radio Public, or Spotify. And be sure to rate and review. Also, follow me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash retcongreg. Join our Patreon at patreon.com slash retconindustries where we have three monthly subscription tiers of $1, $5, and $10. Depending on which tier you choose, you will have your name listed in the credits for every future podcast and music release, as well as access to bonus audio and video content, Bandcamp discounts, and exclusive merchandise through the Retcon Swag Club. Finally, please check out all the music up for sale at retconindustries.bandcamp.com. And now, back to the podcast. I loved this year's Dungeon Siege, and and obviously I'm going to get I'll get Josh and Shane on here at some point um, to talk about that too. But I I felt that you know just just watching it live when I could and just you know the variety. Everybody was kind of doing a little bit different. Everybody had their own kind of visual style to their performances, which you know, given the situation of you know being in lockdown or pandemic times, like you know everybody had their own kind of vibe to the set and and just you know, seeing the people in the chat, just supporting it all, you know, just being like, you know, like, yeah, awesome. And, and I got the sense that if like somebody was watching something and maybe didn't like a specific artist that they just kept quiet about it, you know, it's like, you know, just let the supportive stuff comes out. And it's like, yeah, if you don't like what this, this person's doing with their project, then, you know, don't, don't listen to it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you know, it's, but the fact was, like, there was something, a little of something for everybody, which, you know, I I found really, really cool. Yeah, definitely. And and the and the other thing I was uh, thinking too, and uh, maybe you could speak to this as well, is is I find, um, with with the kind of electronic music, with the synthesizer stuff, um, I know for myself personally, I found myself getting really getting in touch with my own like it, as it with the music becoming a more honest representation of of my identity you know like my identity i felt like with you know and and, and you know and and that seems to come out in a lot of other people's work where like you know they're you know i i think of uh i'm gonna pronounce it wrong probably but orang for for example i find you know, like that project is really um, someone's identity being brought to life in music. And, you know, do, do you find with, with your projects, given that they're all kind of like various, you know, like there's differences between them, but do you find like it all kind of comes together under the evergreen identity? <laughs> <laughs> if that's the best way to put it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that yeah, it's. I think that's kind of why another reason to go back to um, why I end up with so many projects is I, I sort of feel a little fragmented and in, in what I'm interested in anyway. You know, I'm, my interests are all over the place, and um, so yeah, I think when you look at all of them, all all of the projects, it, it kind of pieces together. I feel like who I am and some of them more than others, of course, I've always thought it was cool that, um, it rang or it wrong. I'm not, I'm also not sure how (laughs) to say that. Um, I, I've, I've always found it interesting that he actually has all of his under one umbrella. When you go through a lot of his work, it's kind of all, all over the place. Um, still, you know, firmly rooted in like synthesizer music but um he has one album that's like a cyberpunk album yeah and uh but it it works with his world and it i think that's him expressing that same kind of uh those fragmented interests in the same way that i do but i can't personally put them all under one project like that yeah i agree 
uh, I mean, because that's kind of what I do. Like everything of mine is under one umbrella because I can. Well, mostly because I can't be bothered to come up with separate band names. <laughs> that's that's just me, and and you know, and and uh, you know, that's yeah, that's just I just kind of like you know everything that's electronic goes here, whether it's Dungeon Synth, whether it's Dark Ambient. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but you know, but I also get it. I I you know I also get you know I respect um, you know the ability to kind of, I don't want to say compartmentalize, but kind of create, like you said, you know, the various projects and, and everything like that to, and, and, you know, and some people, you know, come up with really intricate stories behind each project, you know, and I, and I love that the storytelling, the world building is, is just something that, you know, I appreciate from a creative standpoint, just, you know, like, wow, I'm in awe of what, what you do <laughs> you know and so yeah i'm in awe of what you do <laughs> in terms of the world building for yourself um well you know and speaking of you know having disparate disparate interest interests one thing that i i found funny uh connecting with you on was buffy <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> and i just have buffy listed here and and it was funny because I was I was listening back to, to the Del Mac O stuff, and I was just like, and, and it, it, it didn't register at first, but upon second, uh, upon my most recent list, I'm like, oh, the death of Maggie Walsh. Oh, <laughs> season <Yeah>. four. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have any Buffy projects <laughs> in the works? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I've considered. That. <laughs> I, I'm I'm really especially just new to um, enjoying Buffy just because my partner's huge into Buffy so we we uh, rewatched it all <laughs> um, but yeah I I love that show <laughs> I love Angel too it's great same same here yeah yeah uh, I haven't revisited the shows in a while but uh, but yeah those are like a huge a huge part of my 20s i'll say because like you know that was because i think i got into it in season six right as because i was like right after i had moved to to boston you know i was living on my own for the first time and 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 so i think a lot of that resonated with me with you know season six of buffy season i think it was season two or season three of angel at that point and and yeah <laughs> so yeah <laughs> Hooray yeah, I <laughs> Yeah, I I am really I think that shows kind of um it's really set the bar for how I enjoy like television shows or movies now. Um, cuz there's so much about the like practical effects of that show that it's just so beautiful and it's like, like yeah, I mean we're watching now um you know, 20 some odd years later, 30, 30 years later, whatever. Um, some yeah. aspects of it can feel, can feel dated for sure. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's dated, but it's like, I mean, if you watch a movie from 10 years ago with CGI from 10 years ago, that's dated. And it's oh, like, yeah. I'm, it sort of, so I think that show sort of made me like, it kind of changed how I like watch things now because it's really hard for me to watch things that are, have too much CGI going on. Um, I don't know. It, it's, there's just something really pleasant about the, uh, all the practical effects and there's so much serious stuff on that show, but it's also got obvious like underlying humor to everything yep. that it, I think it just, it's like such a great atmosphere to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I, I find it super comforting uh, to to watch. Yeah, I agree. I yes, yeah, so I just wanted to touch on the Buffy love there because because <laughs> I'm always appreciative <laughs> of finding someone else <laughs> who's into it as well. And yeah, I can't think of 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 a specifically Buffy themed album I could do myself. But you never know. You know, there's so many things in that show that you know they could just come out in different ways. I don't know. I I'm surprised that there isn't. 
at least nothing that I've found, like a, a specifically a dungeon synth al- album or project based around it. Because, yeah, I mean, there's so much, uh, well, obviously vampires. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's so much to it that I think could translate really well into a, a dungeon synth project. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, it was it's it was funny. I was like, I forget who I, I think I was talking to um, to Jim from Cond, um, or not from Cond is Cond. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but I was talking to him, and and we were talking because at the time I was playing uh, the the Shining Force video games from the '90s, and 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 then I remember he was like, oh, you know, there's a whole Dungeon Synth project based on that. I'm like, what? <laughs> and, oh, oh. And, then, and then like at at first it was shock, like really. And then part of me was like, of course there is, <laughs> yeah, of course there is, because you know, uh, I mean, everybody, you know, um, um, again, butchering names, but and you know, Valistras exists with, you know, comes from the World of Warcraft world, I believe. Um, I'll have to get them on this podcast at some point too. Um, but you know, every there's, I feel like there's some sort of fantasy fantasy um franchise out there either video game cartoon whatever there's most likely a dungeons and project <laughs> yeah so, uh, which i love I, again that's something i love you know it's either you're coming up with your own worlds or you're exploring a pre-existing world and yeah i love that you kind of touched on it briefly with, when you mentioned the old yamaha keyboard but uh for the musician nerds out there uh, like me, uh, in terms of gear, um, you know, do you tend to use the same gear, and or or how does it differ? How do you differ up, you know, between projects in terms of you know making sure something sounds independent of the others? You know, is there is there a process there? Yeah, that's and to keep coming back to what kind of keeps projects separate. Um, yeah, that's a big part of it. Uh, for me, Fogweaver is, it's like, and kind of like how I said about how I have this tendency to box things in a little too much sometimes. Um, Fogweaver, I, I do try to keep very much um, based around like old Casio and Yamaha tones. Um, so I have a I have a Casio CZ5000, Yamaha PSS270, and a PSS570. And then I have a Casio, I think it's a CTK3500, uh, which is a newer keyboard, but it kind of has those cheesy old um, sample-based sounds. So I, that's one of the ways, like, when I go into, like, working on um, a project... Um, if I'm working with those tools more often than not, I, that means I'm, I'm working on some fog weaver stuff. There's a couple, there are a couple exceptions to that. Like my, uh, little project wand limb. Um, I did all on my PSS 570, I think. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then, yeah, um, that's kind of one of the other ways that Hideous Gomphidius is uh, experimental is I I use whatever tools I want to with that um, and that includes I, I have several guitar pedals that I use for that project and uh, manipulate the sound in weird ways and, and stuff so that's where I kind of get a little bit more experimental say, okay, actually, I want to use, like, I want to use my microcorg for this, you know. Uh, I want to use my drum machine or, or whatever it may be. Um, so that I, with that one, I get a little bit more experimental. And then Del Mac O, I stick entirely to my, um, my synthesizer synthesizers, so to just be able to create my own patches and stuff um that's a that's definitely and go actually going back to the what i was talking about earlier um with the creation of del maco that was a part of it is i 
I was getting into um, recording with my four track, but I was also exploring a little bit more about act the actual synthesis side of things. Um, so that uh, I, I prefer to work with a synthesizer with that. But yeah, I'm, I, in general, I'm a little bit more of like a a tactile person in that I like keyboards. I like having keys to play or knobs to turn. Um, so I'm not, there's almost nothing that I've made that's like MIDI based or uh, anything like that. And not that I'm knocking that, it's just who how I work. I've, I've tried, I like really want to sometimes um, delve a little bit more into that side of things. But yeah, I just can't, I can't figure it out as well. So I, I usually just stick to my my pedals or my um, my keyboard. Yeah, I I agree with you. Um, I mean, I I tend to use soft synths and MIDI a lot more in my stuff, but um, I I feel like a luddite sometimes with with the, with the software and the plugins, and because I come from the guitar world, I come from like you said pedals. I'm like, okay, this this pedal has got three knobs. So how do I tweak them to make the sound I want? Whereas if I pull up like, you know, a synthesizer plugin, it's like you're using the mouse to turn the knobs, but it's like I said, it's not tactile. It's not this. Yeah. I, I get what you mean. There's like this, this certain feeling, you know, which is why, I, you know, I started getting my hardware synth collection up and running here because yeah there's just something about that it's just something about like all right i'll turn a knob and see what happens and if it works cool <laughs> if it makes an awesome yeah. sound amazing yeah and it's yeah there, there's something too um i can sit and watch videos about people describing what certain things do like i don't know something on a synthesizer like i can have somebody be like oh yeah here's what like cutoff does. Here's what like t tweaking the cutoff knob will do, but that just it doesn't click with me. Yeah. But if I sit same. and yeah, <laughs> but if I sit and actually do that, I'm like, okay, I I understand what uh, what this does. And yeah, I've been the same with pedals. I um before I was doing dungeon synth, I've kind of made ambient music for a long time, and I had one project that was specifically like live uh focused on making it live um like guitar ambient music and so yeah it was all manipulating pedals and i just uh, really fell in love with tweaking knobs and um manipulating sound in that way and yeah you can like a lot of the stuff i was making with that project I could certainly just sit at my uh, sit in Reaper and mess around with a variety of uh, synths or, or whatever um, uh, VSTs um, and and get some similar atmospheres, but it just it's just not how how I work. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. It's, and yeah, it it yeah, there's definitely a difference and. You know, I, I just find with the VSTs or, or anything like that, uh, it's like I'm really just mostly just like, does the preset inspire me? You know, like, you know, and I'll tweak the effects on it later, but or, or as I'm going, but it's like, does the sound, you know, inspire me? Because I don't know how to tweak it to make it inspire. You know what I mean? Like, I just have, I'm kind of at the mercy of whoever designed the presets for whatever soft synth i'm using because i'm just like all right well let's hope uh <laughs> let's see if this sounds good and <laughs> sure you know yeah. which which is cool and it has its own merits but you know i do have that like you said the tactile sense um yeah and that's something uh, another thing with within dungeon synth especially um that i think is cool about um about the genre is that there's <laughs> You know, there's several camps to that. To a lot of that, there are people who are really into VSTs and um, kind of the, the hi-fi side of things. Um, and again, I love it all. <laughs> I'm all over the place with that stuff. But I love that there's 
a lot of people who really, really, one of the things they really love about the genre is the imperfection, especially when you get into older dungeon synth works. A lot of the charm of it is that it's kind of sloppy and kind of like the the keyboards give off some bad noises sometimes or whatever it may be. It cuts cuts out uh, from the tape stopping or, or something like that. Um, and I think that that's, that's something I especially like with fo- uh, when I mess around with Fog Weaver is I'll leave some of it imperfect and I don't, you know, I don't really like quantize things or anything like that because I can't really. Yeah. <laughs> I could go through and, and fix it all uh, very tediously if I wanted to, but I sort of like that it feels very human and sometimes that's very imperfect and mm-hmm. for me that's the charm of a lot of a lot of the music is that they're it feels very wholesome and human and uh genuine yeah. and again that's not to knock any of the stuff that is quantized right no i exactly i agree it's, it's yeah um also i just want to just apologize because i just realized i've been saying hideous gum phibious the entire time and is hideous gum phidious. I oh, I didn't that. even notice. I apologize for that. Oh, that's, <laughs> that that's is okay. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't catch that. <laughs> no, 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 no worries. It's it's just you know my me being like uh, ah, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Here's this really cool band name you worked hard on and <laughs> this project program and I'm misnaming it. So <laughs> apologies for that. But um. But yeah, I mean that was really all the basic topics I had. I mean, this was awesome. I mean, I'm I'm really happy to, you know, virtually meet you and talk to you just because, like I said, you know, getting into the scene. I mean, your projects were something that I've kind of a gateway for me. Like, you know, the first time I was like hearing this project, I was like, oh, this is cool. This is you know, and it started, you know, I. It, it, it's so it's it's cool for me to talk to you to, just because I, I really appreciate and respect what you do as a as an oh, artist so thanks yeah i yeah. appreciate that oh yeah yeah no problem and uh oh i'm sorry yeah there was one more thing <laughs> so whose idea was it to come up with uh, the the split between you fog lord <laughs> and fog <laughs> Uh, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just look up and make sure I'm getting the names right. But uh, <laughs> Fog Castle, Fog Lord, and Fog Weaver. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think where that came from is the um, the Northeast Dungeon Siege last year, uh, which was initially supposed to be in person, but ended up being an online thing for obvious reasons. Um, I was going to play as Fogweaver and Foglord was playing. Um, and they, we actually got put on the same night. <laughs> so it was like me and then Foglord closed out the night. Um, and so the online siege happened. And I, I think that's where uh, Foglord actually reached out to me and said, we should do a split. And I think uh, people even said something about it in the chat. <laughs> just joking about it that night um and yeah it, i i really i really like fog lord and i think that his music is similarly kind of a dreamy atmosphere and all of that and so i was really excited and and same thing actually with fog castle and so fog lord was like well I, you know what if we also included fog castle in on this so <laughs> yeah um it's funny I kind of like, I like the, the, uh, uh, there's obviously kind of the, the gimmick to it, but I, I don't know that it was like as intentional. Like some people think like, or have said in passing that, you know, it seemed like it was supposed to be kind of a joke and it wasn't really, it was just like, Hey, we all have a fog in our name. So yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. do this. Yeah, exactly. I didn't. I didn't take it as a joke at all. I just. I just. Yeah. I just thought it was cool. That's like, oh yeah. Why? It makes sense. You know. Why not do something like this? And and yeah. So 
anyway, I just wanted to say, yeah, I mean, obviously it's, you know, you know, I kind of laugh a little when I talk about it, but I do recognize it as being a serious project, not, <laughs> not, not just a goofy one-off thing you guys did. <laughs> yeah, but it was cool. And I do like, um, it, it's interesting for, I think even outside of our obvious, like having fog in the title, um, I'm, those are two artists that I, I, I think I would have wanted to do splits with anyway, um, because we have so much similar, like so much of a similar atmosphere. And I think that that split ended up turning out like really cohesive, which is something I enjoy a lot in splits. I'm always a little bit conflicted about doing splits because sometimes you listen to ones that are like, wow, they really nailed it. And then others you're like, it's like one artist, uh, I don't know. They're just like very, very different artists and it doesn't always land in the same way. (laughs) I'm kind of conflicted about doing them sometimes, but yeah, that one turned out really well, I think. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I had to ask about that, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, but yeah, seriously, thank you for, taking this time to to talk um i mean i i really appreciate it and you know yeah thank you yeah <laughs> I don't oh, know. thanks for having me on yeah